Hello, my name is David Martinez, and today we're going to share inspiring stories so that you travel and see the world, even if it does land you in the hospital with a broken arm, sharing a room with a rat. One of the things that's interesting when you travel is this 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 relationship between planning a trip and having everything kind of ready made and the unexpected. How do you approach a trip when, at least for me, the the unexpected is usually where it's at. That's the most interesting, most fun part. But you have to go with some kind of a plan. So how do you balance that out? Right. I think um, having an idea of what I'm going to land when I when I land, what am I going to see more or less? Um, and maybe where my first, worst night's going to be. That's kind of like the first thing. So you got to have that first hotel night, that first hostel. Yeah. But, you know, also be planning for possibly when you reach that place, like, ah, oh, this isn't quite the best option. And then having a way just to kind of, eh, I'm going to do this one instead. Um, in fact, there was a time when I arrived from Argentina into Peru. I had no place to stay planned out. And my thought at the time was, you know, I'm just going to ask some taxi drivers what they would recommend. And turns out this one taxi driver is like, oh, yeah, I know a place. It's just down the way because I was flying out to Arequipa in like 13 hours. So I couldn't, you know, do much of anything. And, you know, the hotel was pretty grimy. It, it was it was affordable. I maybe slept a little bit, but it was fine and it was safe. And I just got a taxi back to the airport the next day. But I had no plan. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just, uh, you know, it helped to speak the language, I will say. Um but yeah, that element of not knowing exactly what to expect is kind of exciting. Granted, I was on my part. own. That's always the, for yeah. me, when I travel, I, likewise, I think you look stuff up, you see, you know, the top 10 things to do perhaps. But every time when I take a trip, I come back with, you know, this is the, the most amazing thing that, that happened was not planned, was not a part of the itinerary. And yet it's so hard to show up to a country without having looked anything up, right? Then you run into uh, this the, of the problem of I only have two hours. I need to get the most out of these two hours. Right. You know, I, I want to every, every last second I need to take advantage of. Right. Know? I mean, that whole advantage thing though, I mean, sometimes when you're traveling, um, as someone coming from North America, you, you have this idea like, Oh, everyone's going to try to take advantage of me and overcharge me. And, and, you know, they're going to take me to a spot and, you know, try to rob me. And, Really, that's not the case. I mean, generally... The, Overwhelmingly not the case, I would yes, say. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you will be maybe upcharged a little bit. And I was always so sensitive to that. I was always like, oh, I don't want to, you know, get the gringo tax and all that. <laughs> so my wife and I, we arrived in Lima one night. We were... I, thought, I don't remember where we were coming back from. I think it was um, like Waras or something. Anyway, and I was bent on getting this one price on a taxi because in those days, this was like... Uh, 2012, 2013, we, you had to negotiate every taxi price. There was no meter. Uh, there was no Uber. There was nothing. I mean, you just had to get in there. So I was like, I'm only going to pay 20 soles. Like I'm not going to pay anymore. What is 20 soles? Like $4? 20 soles okay. then was probably like, I don't know, six, six to seven dollars, okay. but it's at the airport. So everything's higher. So I'm asking around, no one wants to do it. Everyone's like, no, 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 this and this and this and this. Like, I'll take you right now for this price. No, no, no. And then finally, some guy goes, hey, he'll take you for 20 soles. And I look over and he has his key. I'm like, all right, vamos. And so we, my wife looks at me and I'm like, so we start walking. We pass all the taxis. I'm like, well, this isn't normal. And we walk out of the airport grounds around the corner, down this alley. And this is in Callao. And uh, <laughs> we arrived at this really old pretty well kept, but it's probably like a 1978, like Toyota Corona. <laughs> and it was a two door coupe. And I'm like, ¿Qué es esto? and he's like, it's mi carro. This is my car. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so we get in, we're sitting in the back, no way to really get out because it's a two door. All that to say, we got there safely. The guy was super nice. Um, he just wanted the money and he said he kind of lived nearby. So it was a perfect situation. And it was fine. But what I did learn is don't get so bent on trying to get that price because 
it may not work out as well as it did that one time. So yeah, sometimes we're so bent on not getting you call you call it the gringo tax. Yeah. This is because I'm I'm a foreigner, I'm American, and then I show up and therefore I have to pay a little bit extra. And that yeah. can get it can get annoying, but that's the that's what you mean by the gringo that's tax. That's what I right? mean. Yeah. So at the difference, what what would it what would have a taxi cost? You said you paid twenty soles, what would have been like thirty soles, forty soles? Yeah, I think it was around like thirty five was kind of the cheapest I could get. And, you know, I was, I was laughing because I probably saved myself about, I don't know, $3. Right, right. And that's what we often forget about is this. Insignificant. This but what a great experience. What a great story. To it tell, was. No? Yeah, that, that happens to me often with, um, especially in countries where you have to bargain. I'm not used to bartering. I'm not used to going to markets and right. arguing and, and negotiating a price. And it takes a couple of days. I remember when I was in Egypt in Cairo and, and everything is negotiated there. Everything you have to. And, and it's kind of it, it's kind of a game, and there's a respect that you can gain or you can earn if you learn how to do it, you know. Right. But it takes me a couple of days, and and same thing. I we we were gonna my wife and I we were gonna take uh, ride camels up the backside of the of the pyramids because that's kind of it's kind of a cool way to enter the pyramids for, on a camel in the desert. Yeah, that's know? the dream. It right was there. amazing. Yeah, uh, and same thing. And and we had negotiated a price with the um, with the vendor at the hotel. And when we got there, it was like twice as much. And I just kind of rolled my eyes like, oh, here we go. And we went back and forth, but they still charged us more than we what we had already um, negotiated. But it wasn't that much more, right? It wasn't, sure. so at the end of the day, it's more, it's hurting your pride more than it is, you know, anything else. And I remember also when I was in Thailand, kind of same thing, you're, you're negotiating, arguing, and it's exhausting. But then there was one day at the market where I saw these two, these um, white shirts that people often wear on the beach and they looked cool. I was going to spend a couple of weeks in, in Thailand. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to buy these, but I'm not going to pay more than this amount. Right. You know? And so I go up and I'm talking to the, to the vendor and she's quoting me this outrageous price. And I just kept saying, no, lower, lower, <laughs> lower, lower. But I was having fun. And part of it was, I didn't really care if I got the shirts or not. I was yeah. just going to have fun doing it. Was the it. game. Yeah. So I got my price. And so I, I bought these two shirts that I never wore. Of course. <laughs> because those shirts, they look great in the market. And then of uh, course, when I put them on. <laughs> how many? <laughs> times have I had that similar experience where you you think you just really want these items that you're just you know like in Cambodia you go to I was at these markets like the Russian market and everything looks so cool and interesting and you know they these the pants that you know are kind of loose fitting and you know that you think everyone wears and like oh I'm gonna get some of those and I'm gonna wear them when I go back and it's gonna be really exotic never worn never wore them. gave them to Goodwill <laughs> I just <laughs> But I had them, and it was the experience. Right? I bought a, I bought a pair of pants in Singapore recently. Uh, so kind of same thing. You're in this different mode, different different setting, and I've worn them twice, and both yeah. times around the house. I can't bring yeah. myself to bring these like baggy pants that come up to half halfway down my shin. Yeah. Alan de Bouton, he's got a book called The Art of Travel, and he talks about this need that we have to to purchase something to, so that we can bring back with us something from that country. And part of it is this desire or need to carry with us this journey, this trip that we've had. And it, it doesn't look the same. It doesn't feel the same no. in our country when we bring it back. I, I try to bring something back. I've got the the souvenirs that I always bring back to my kids, but then, you know, there's, I have a plate hanging that I, um, um, in, in our dining room that we, I bought in, I want to say Croatia. Um, yeah, I think it was Croatian Zagreb. Uh, and it's and if you saw the plate, you wouldn't know that it was from Croatia. You would mm -hmm. think maybe I bought it in some at some thrift store or something. Thrift store, yeah, or or a garage sale or something. But I know that I bought it. I know what I what I experienced yeah. that day. And I just got back from Japan and same thing. I bought this this little hanging thing that we put in our kitchen now that has Mount Fuji. That one's a little bit more. That one says Japan. It's sure. very it's very touristy. And again, when I bought it at the market in Tokyo, it it was um it was, this is, this is my memory from my trip in yeah. Japan. And now it's hanging in my kitchen. It doesn't feel as it's going to take me back. Yeah. But it, it does it take me back. I don't know what we, <laughs> what we have found to be the most, um, rewarding take backs from travel. And this sounds kind of funny, but, um, like political signs. So in our house, in our home, we have maybe three or four different, um, political signs. So after the elections are done, you have all these political signs and these images of who to vote for and all these like funny, you know, phrases and such. Um, and we would just be driving out in the countryside and I'm like, Hey, get out my Gerber multiplier, clip some <laughs> down because the elections were over. And, uh, so I was helping them out, you know, help them clean up. And so we have those hanging in our house and they're a really fun way to kind of remind us of our time there. Um, 
or those really colorful chicha yeah. um, posters for like concerts and stuff. We have a couple of those. Yeah, that's a good that's a good souvenir. People often collect uh, coasters, coasters yeah. from different different places around the world. Yeah. That's interesting. So we're in talking about this unknown or this getting into a taxi that you're not sure of. Obviously, you want to be safe. You want to be careful. But you also want to experience things in a different way. Maybe not. You know, I always I discourage taking taxis from the hotel. I like I like public transportation, even though it's it's exhausting. It's tiring. Uh, when, when I was in, in Seoul recently, saying, you know, you arrive and you could take a taxi. But the the airport and it's in Incheon, which is like an hour outside of yeah. Seoul. And Seoul itself is massive, a big city. And so you can take a taxi and it's going to cost you, I don't know, $100 maybe. I, I didn't even check because I knew it was going to be really expensive. It wasn't going to Or happen. you take this combination of bus to a subway to yeah. something, you know, and it always works out. Somehow you, you kind of figure it out. And it's so much more um, enriching, I think, to to be sitting there with other other people, other travelers as well. Not all sure. Koreans, you know, but it's it's exciting. We would take public transportation in Peru all the time. It was one soul, no matter where you were going, which yeah. is like 30 cents. And my wife and I would always take it. They're called combis, right? Combis. combis. Yeah, yeah. So we would take combis and all of the Peruvians that we knew were like, I can't believe you don't take taxis. You take combis. Those aren't safe. It's like, it's cheap. It's interesting. Um, there's people that just hop on the bus and try to sell you stuff and sing a song. One time we even took from our, where we were living, we packed our like, you know, Osprey bags, and we were going to some place within the country. We were going to the airport, and we just took a combi to the airport. We just, <laughs> it dropped us off a couple blocks outside the airport, and we just wandered in, and we told stories about that to Peruvians, and they're like, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you didn't get robbed. And I was like, hmm, well, I, I guess I can't believe it either now. <laughs> but... But it was fun. Yeah, that reminds me too. When I was in Brazil, same thing. We had these big mass. My buddy and I had these big massive um, backpacks. We were backpacking around Peru and, and Brazil for three months. And instead of taking the taxi, which is the easy thing to do, also more expensive. I was a lot. Yeah. I didn't have as much money as I do now, I guess. Uh, but you're in these in in this crowded um, subways, you know, and you're just kind of bumping into people. And yeah, how did how do you not get robbed? I don't know. But it's all it's a lot more fun, I think, and a lot cheaper, I think, to do it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things about that unknown that, um, you know, I always take with me. And, you know, a lot of that too is kind of that what if, like, what if I get hurt? Right. What if something happens? What if I have to go to the hospital? What if I need to use an ambulance? Because do you have experience with this? Have you been to uh, the hospital? In a yes, <laughs> I've been, I've been to the hospital, uh, in Peru for a broken arm and also for two of my children being born. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So the broken arm happened. Well, the, the pastor of our church, we were living in the jungle at the time, he was the 10 time Peruvian motocross champion. Okay. That's so awesome. he had this ministry called Motociclistas por Cristo. Okay. Right. So a bunch of us, you know, we, cause we had dirt bikes. That was our car that we had no car. It was just a dirt bike. My wife and I just rode around on it and we were out riding on this dirt bike track and I hit this turn a little too fast, put my arm down, snap, right? Didn't know it was completely broken. So I kind of picked the bike back up used the accelerator with my fingers and got back to the to the main area. You don't know was. your arm is broken. You must have felt some kind of well, pain. Or... Well, it was shock. So I could move it. And so we got back and everyone was looking at me and they laid me down on one of the trailers and I just about passed out. Everything kind of went white and they're feeding me water. And they're like, we need to take you and get this x-ray. So we went into Pucalpa. We were like 30 minutes outside. And <laughs> We get to this clinic, um, Clinica Monte Oreb, it was called. <laughs> I still remember. And we walk in to get a radiografia, the x-ray. And I sit down, put my arm on this table. And I look over and there's a giant rat <laughs> sitting in the corner. And my friend who was Peruvian was with me. He said, oh, I don't like rats. I got to get out of here. So there I am sitting. Anyway. You and the rat. <laughs> just just the rat and I. La rata y yo. And we got the x-ray. They showed it to me. They're like... Señor, está roto. <laughs> They're like, it's broken. So anyway, my friend told me, do not get surgery in Pucalpa. You have to go to Lima. And I'm like, all right, that's a flight away and I've got a broken arm. So his dad was visiting. He was a retired plastic surgeon. He ran over to the, the botica, farmacia, whatever, got a couple syringes, jabbed him in my, in my waist to numb the pain. Um, he extracted some of the fluid that was in my elbow. We got a flight that night into Lima. I had to hide my broken arm in a coat so that they didn't 
tell me that I couldn't fly. Because they wouldn't let you fly with a broken arm. Right. And so they're like, why is this guy wearing a coat? It's like 100 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> so I get on there, I put my arm on the, the tray table and finally get seen the next day. I got surgery, got two pins put in. Um, excellent procedure. Very well done. Clean, um, clean hospital. It was great very experience. clean yeah. hospital. Very knowledgeable doctor. Did all of his schooling in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, and anyway... Um, so there I was with this big cast and my wife was about six and a half, seven months pregnant at the time. <laughs> We're walking around Lima. I got this big old cast. She's got this big old belly. And they're like, what are these two up to? Why are these two here? What? Are... <laughs> anyway, so when the time came for me to get those pins taken out, we were in the jungle where we lived in Pucalpa. And the pastor of our church, um, the same guy who helped me out, he said, there's a bunch of board certified surgeons coming from Minnesota and that are going to be doing some uh, operations in the hospital here for people pro bono. And he said, I bet you could get on the list. And I said, that would be fantastic. So I got on the list and went to the hospital, uh, paid my, you know, I think it was like $40, $50, went in full anesthesia, went under, they took my pins out. And I woke up in the recovery room wearing this gown, wearing these pilled up like hospital socks that were used probably by 150 different people before me <laughs> mosquitoes landing on my face uh, but no rats, rats. no rats okay <laughs> and the doctor who did the surgery for me he's like hey how you feeling i'm like ah feeling okay he's like i just saved you ten thousand dollars ten thousand dollars this is the doctor from minnesota yes okay so would it, would it have cost ten thousand dollars in peru if you'd gone back to lima and gotten the pins removed uh, or, or is he t- is he thinking like if you go back to the u.s if i was you? yeah because a lot of people have procedures like that they want to go back to their home Mm -hmm. countries or, you know, go someplace else anyway. Um, but yeah, it would have been a very expensive procedure, but he gave me my pins back a couple (laughs) titanium pins. I do. (laughs) Nice. And, uh, boy, you know, and I still have the the nice scar to show for it here. Um, but it was okay and everything worked out and everyone was nice. And same with the baby birthing stories. Yeah. I mean, my wife, you know, she can tell you that those hospitals were top tier, top notch, best care she's ever received. In Lima? In Lima. In Lima, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great to hear because I, I often tell students and people wanting to travel, there's this idea, this misnomer that the hospitals in the U.S., they, this, these are the best hospitals in the world. And maybe they are. I don't know. Maybe we, we do maybe. have the top I don't, hospitals. I'm not sure. I don't know where they are. But whatever you do, don't get treatment abroad because it's going to be these rundown, dirty places with people who aren't prepared and so forth. Yeah, and that's not true. Overwhelmingly, the experience is the exact opposite. It's great care. It's it's in some in some ways better care, mm-hmm. and it's always this might be a hundred percent true all the time. Always cheaper. <laughs> yes, yes. Maybe unless you're in. I mean, I can't think of a place to. No, I can't think of any place that would be more expensive. Yeah, sure there might be. I don't know. I can't think of any place either. But I, I, in, in Spain, I had a, I led a, a group of students in Sevilla. And one of my students, her mom came to visit. And she some, somehow stepped out of a bus or out of a car and stepped wrong off the curb and broke her, her foot in mm-hmm. a couple of different places. It was this horrible accident that happened. And she was in the hospital for multiple days. And I remember she was just, she was terrified at how much this was going to cost. Uh, that's, that's what Americans often well, of think course. about right away. We all, we, we right away, we go to the, to, to the cost, feeling, yeah. you know, and I forget what the final bill was, but it was, it was a couple hundred dollars maybe. And it was, and this was a couple of several days of sleeping in the hospital yeah. of procedures of surgeries that she had done undergone. And yeah, and it, and it wasn't expensive at all. This, you know, this idea that when something happens right away, we think about the cost. I was in the hospital with my wife recent, not that long ago, a couple of years ago, she was having back pain. And um, we tried a couple of things. There was a an epidural, I think, that she got that didn't work. And there, in the in the moment, the doctor says, "You might think about taking an ambulance to the ER." And her first response was, "We don't have the money." And yeah. she's in a oh, lot yeah. of pain. She's hurting. Dollar but signs. That's right away what she went to. But that's not the case around the world. So it's great, you know, as, as awful as that experience must have been, it, it kind of confirms my suspicion in my own experience that care in hospitals and clinics and doctors around the world is is top notch. It can be top notch anyway. Yep. Yep. And uh, we had somewhat similar experiences in Indonesia. But when we were in Bandung, sometimes they would refer you to go to Jakarta because mm-hmm. a lot of the uh, medical professionals there were even more highly trained, but again, the cost was not even a shred of what it would be. 
Yeah, or the other misnomer too often when you, like in Spain, again, to go back to Spain, uh, there was a, somebody once said, you know, the last thing I want to do is take my daughter to a Spanish hospital. I remember <laughs> hearing this and thinking, really? Uh, my daughter, when we were, my wife and I were visiting Spain with our family and my daughter, my, my in-laws have this older house out in the country and, and the door, I think it's like an iron door. It's this big, massive, heavy thing. And my two-year-old daughter tried to close the door, but she got her fingers stuck in it. And it almost chopped off part of her finger. It was like kind of dangling a bit. <laughs> so we rushed her to the hospital and she was seen right away. Hmm. They, they were going to try to give her a stitch, but it was, her fingers were too small. But it was, there was no waiting in line. There was no, you know, this, these ideas that we often carry with yeah. socialized medicine. It's, it, it hasn't been my experience. So, yeah, I'm glad you're okay. You still have the scar to, to show for it. But what yeah. an experience motorbiking around, around it's Peru. It's a fantastic story. It's like, oh, how'd you break your arm? Well, I was riding on a dirt bike <laughs> in the Peruvian jungle. And, well, then I shared an x-ray room with a rat. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> it's like, don't try to follow my footsteps. Let me just say that. But, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so many, so many unexpected experiences as far as like entering a country for the first time, you know, I mean, cause that was when we were pretty green in Peru, yeah. but I remember how, how long into this experience you, you've been living in Peru for how long when this happened? We had been there probably for maybe just under a year. Okay. So it was, it was pretty new, but you know, you just don't know what to expect. And yeah. again, you know, I think the Lord always provides, I think God, gives us that sense of, of adventure. Um, and it's okay. And I think we were talking about this earlier, but it's okay to go and travel and see the world and not have like a missions trip agenda. Yeah. You know, um, I think wherever we go, we are representing Christ as his ambassador Yeah, and going around and seeing all the beautiful things in the world and experiencing what people in other parts of the world experience is, is fine. It yeah. doesn't have to be in the name of missions or goodwill or, or things like that. I mean, wherever you go, do good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's great to hear. I, I always tell students that I hear this often. I, in fact, a pastor, uh, not too long ago made a comment. I, you know, I wish I, I you know, th over COVID there was an inability to travel. And he said, I, I want to go on a missions trip because I miss traveling, you know? And I just remember thinking, hmm. You can do both of those things, or you can do you know you can travel. You can see the world. It reminds me of Ivan Illich and his and his um, call to to go and travel and and participate and climb the mountains and stay in the hotels and eat the food and yeah. and not always have this idea that you have to you have to bring something right. You can be the one who goes and and learns uh, in the process. Yeah, and it's kind of uh, to you know to counter that. I know there's a book out there that. Um, by Anthony Bourdain. It's called uh, World Travel, An Irreverent Guide. <laughs> nice. So it kind of <laughs> goes away from that idea of wherever you are doing good and I, or whatever you are, do good. But I think the way Anthony Bourdain saw travel was very, very adventurous, very off the beaten path. Yeah. And, you know, while there are probably are several things in that book that I wouldn't necessarily agree with. I think his outlook really inspired a lot of people to go out and just do those things yeah. that you're not really sure about. Yeah. And he was genuine too. Yes. I think in, in this, cause I think there are a couple, there are some moments in his travels where, uh, I remember, I think once he was, they were fishing and they were going to get this fresh, fresh, um, fish, I suppose, and then cook it up and stuff. And, um, but the, the guys I think were throwing the fish in, you know, this like already dead fish. And, yeah. and he was, he was just appalled by this. He's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna create this, this fake or fictitious reality for my show. Like I, I, I want something that's genuine and yeah. real. So yeah, I appreciate a lot of the ways that Bourdain traveled or how he encouraged and inspired people to travel for sure. That's a good book. I've recommended a book called bad tourist in the past, but I, so I can't cheat and re re recommend <laughs> the same book, but there's another one, um, while we're talking about this, uh, these ideas around travel, to inspiring um, to go and, and be a part of the unknown. Uh, Rolf Potts, he's a graduate of, of George Fox. Actually, yeah. he's a graduate of George Fox College back when it was a college. Oh. So that's a, that's how old he is. Yeah. <laughs> but he's become, he's a world GFC. world traveler and uh, become a New York Times bestselling author. And he, he wrote a book years ago called Vagabonding the Art of Long-Term Travel. It's a great book. But he recently he published a book called um, The Vagabond's Way, and, uh, and this is like 366 meditations, like the one page meditation basically mm. on travel. And so if you're looking to travel or if you want to be inspired, it's got this great quote at the top. And then he kind of just goes into uh, a very short anecdote. Uh, and the whole idea is to, yeah, to be inspired to go and, and, and see the world. Yeah, I think uh, people oftentimes don't 
know that they need that kind of inspiration, but when you get a hold of something that really ignites something in you, because I mean, it, it makes a difference. I know when I was younger, I had no itch to get out and see the world. I mean, when I was in high school, I went on a trip to, uh, England, France, and Spain with our AP class, right? And, you know, everyone was going. So I was like, yeah, I'll go. But I wasn't thinking to myself, I can't wait to see the world that I haven't seen. And, you know, when you're there, you're taking silly pictures and you're, right. you know, we went to Barcelona, we went to uh, Paris, and we went to London. And, and it was really amazing. But I think that was what planted the seed for me. And then when my wife and I, uh, and we had gone to, other trips in the past. For juniors abroad, I did Switzerland and Italy. Nice. Tried to save as much of my money as I could every day, <laughs> just eating bread and brie every single day. Nice. That's it. You know, That's not uh, a bad meal. That's a good meal. No, meal. it's Nutrition. a good It was cheap over there. But, um, and then I think, you know, God just kind of inspired both my wife and I at the same time to do more long-term travel yeah. and do it, you know, in the name of uh, helping others. And then it ended up turning into education. So it was, it was, a, it was kind of a wide, wild twist turn. Uh, it was, it was a strange path that it took for both of us to get that fire. Yeah. It's, it's, it can be inspiring. There's the uh, p- people have different experiences. There's, they see a movie, they, they read a book for me. I remember reading the lonely planet Burma <laughs> just for fun and, and being we inspired and, and wanting to, yeah, I love, I love lonely planet, uh, uh, but yeah, I think the, the other thing too that Roth Potts often talks about is walking until your day becomes interesting. And I recently I was on a trip. I, I came back from South Korea and I, I put that into practice. It's something that I had already that I had kind of done or to a certain extent. But to hear it put in those terms, walk until your day becomes interesting, this idea of of just getting out there, maybe not having everything set in stone. I want to go right. you know, knock off these top 10 things to do in a foreign country, but just yeah, get out there and walk. And I was in... in um, in Seoul. And I, I was, I finished with my meetings and I had, I think I had two hours before my next meeting. So I just walked out, started walking. I ended up, uh, not, not because I planned this, but I ended up walking by the national museum, art museum. And of course I walked in and have it to be free. And I saw this exhibit. It was incredible to see these, uh, artists, uh, and then I walk out I'm walking by a, um, a, I guess an old temple, um, from the 900s or something, mm. something crazy, which is what I love about Seoul as well. You have this this combination of really modern skyscrapers, office buildings right next to this ancient temple that's been around for yeah. years, at UNESCO protected sites. And how much does it cost to get in? Uh, it's a, a couple of dollars. I think it was like $4 mm. to get in. Of course, I go in, I walk around for 30 minutes and I'm a part of uh, so uh, a very important historical landmark. I walk out and then along a, a road, there's a, a, um, a, an exhibit for the honoring the Korean war. Right. And, uh, and so walk along there, I learned about the Korean war, which is incredible. I keep walking a little bit more and there's this a uh, little river, not a river, but it's like, kind of like a man-made water. I always look for water. There's a couple things that I look for when I go to a, to a foreign country. I want to find water. Yeah. I want to find the rooftop restaurant so I can see mm-hmm. the, you know, the, the city the as much as possible. Point, yeah. And I want live music. I try to find live music wherever yeah. I go. And so I was looking for water and, and on my way, I, I encounter all of these things that were not planned and they, they could have been a part of my itinerary. But just to walk around and along the way to meet people, talk to people, I think it's, it's an incredible way to see the country. And of course, the food. And that's the other thing. Oh. I was so excited about the food because South Korea, in my mind, has, I always say top three. But for me, the top three used to be South Korea, Spain, and Peru. Mm-hmm. Having been to Japan now, I got to put oh. Japan at the top as well. But uh, there was this, I think it's called Sambab, Sam, Sambab. And I'm butchering the name, uh, but it's this... Uh, it's it's a meal where you have a leaf, a lettuce leaf, and then um, I believe it's pork, and then a bunch of other things. And you kind yeah. of put a little bit of everything into this into this wrap, this leaf, and you and you wrap it, and then you eat it, and it was incredible. Oh. And so I was asking, where can I get this sampab? And uh, I found this hole in the wall restaurant where you walk down this down these stairs. Oh, I love it. It was uh, I think. It looked almost like somebody's living room, basically, like somebody's kitchen, and they had kind of a little seating area. It's really, really tiny. That's where you want to be. They didn't speak any English. And I sit down, and she's pointing at the menu. I have no idea what it says. <laughs> All I said was sampap, and she's like, sampap, sampap, sampap. And so she starts bringing these things out. I have no idea when she's done bringing things out or 
but it was incredible. I, I loved it. That's like an experience I had in Hanoi where, you know, Hanoi in Vietnam is like the epicenter for what's called Bun Cha. So Bun Cha is like a very, it's different than, you know, normally you think of Vietnamese food, you think of like pho and yeah. uh, vermicelli noodles and things like that. But we wanted, we asked the people there, we're like, where do we get the best Bun Cha? And they're like, well, I don't know if you'd want to go there. And we're like, it doesn't matter. We want to try it. <laughs> so similar, we went to this really hole in the wall place that had like four different stories and the ceiling was extremely low. <laughs> We're just like sitting there and there's these little garbage cans all next to every seat so you can throw stuff away. And these people come out just with all these different dishes and they start throwing them in front of us. And man, it was absolutely delicious. And I will never have Boon Cha <laughs> quite the same ever again. But you know, there were places that sold it all around, you know, where tourists would go. I have to say there probably weren't too many tourists in Hanoi at that point mm. because this was in uh, the end of January 2020. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're we're up near the, you know, the border um, near China and everyone's starting to really get ramped up about this pandemic and this coronavirus everyone's talking about. Mm. So when we were finished with this trip... <laughs> I was asked by the customs agent in the U.S. They're like, "I see you went to, you were in Asia. Did you go? Were you anywhere near mainland China?" And I'm like, "Define near." I was like, <laughs> "No," <laughs> and I just kind of slipped by. And then about you know two and a half weeks later, the world shut down. I was like, "Oh, wow!" <laughs> just eked by. <laughs> but that's amazing. Yeah, food food is a great way to, I think to to enter the and also have an open mind. I always tell students and yep. people who travel, you gotta you gotta go try things and. Ask questions later. Don't ask questions before you eat because it's going to color or it's going to shape your impression yep. of what you might eat. Blood sausage in, in Spain, for instance, or all these things that kind of sure. sound a certain way. But yeah, yeah that's fantastic. And don't well, fear the unexpected. Don't fear the unexpected. That's great. All right, we're going to spin the globe. Let's do it. Put your finger right. down somewhere and let's see. No, like, where did you end up? The United States? Oh, that was California. California. Right? We talk about the U.S. We talk about travel in the U.S. So this is a, you know, world world travel. People yeah. travel in the U.S. I, I saw recently, Roth Potts was talking about a, uh, I forget what it was. It's a hashtag on Instagram where local Kenyans during the pandemic were kind of rediscovering their own country and traveling hmm. within. And and, and I, I feel that way too in the U.S. Uh, there's, there's a lot to see, a lot of different places and locations California, of all places, has all kinds of, you have the mountains, you have the ocean. Yeah. I generally try to stay away from California. I just, every time <laughs> I've been there, it's just been stressful. Where, where and, have, you're talking about LA or San Francisco? What are we I'm talking, talking about? about, yeah, San Francisco. I went there as a kid and I just remember being kind of overwhelmed by the amount of like panhandling and hmm. homeless people just around. And this was, you know, in the late 80s when I was down there. <laughs> Um, I remember getting in a bus wreck. I was on a school bus with a bunch of my classmates in high school. We're going down to Mexico to build a house, driving down I-5, and our bus rear ends a car <laughs> in the middle of in the middle of the freeway in LA. And it was just it was a nightmare. One of our people stood up in the front of the bus and goes, Brace yourselves. And I'm like, what? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> So I just, I think about California and we're holding up traffic for miles and it was just, I don't know. A decidedly but different experience than I've had in California. We're talking a lot about of my the friends camping live down there and, and the they love it. Yeah. yeah. Mount they Shasta. It. Yeah. I, but, it, but to go back to the to traveling within the U.S., I, I encourage, uh, especially kind of van life sort of travel across the mm -hmm. U.S. The U.S. has a great network of roads, of highways, yes. of national parks, of, um, of, yeah, national parks, but also... Uh, what's the other kind of park? Um, national parks and state parks, state parks, but also national forest, yeah. national forest. And it's free to camp in a lot of different areas within mm -hmm. national forests. And it can be a way to, to start to get, start to get that travel itch scratched a little bit. Uh, if, if you're a little bit more concerned about what, what the rest of the world might look like or feel like you could take a trip across the country. And it's, it's amazing often how, how little we travel. I, I've been fortunate enough to have lived in the Southeast 
for a good chunk of my life, but also uh, outside New York City for for a couple of years, and Indiana for a little bit, and now the Pacific Northwest. So I've been to I've been to officially I've been to forty nine states. Although like <laughs> Hawaii, it was it was a layover that I exited the airport. Uh-huh. I don't know if I can count it yet because the whole plan was to go to the beach and, and swim. And That's then how Columbia to Hawaii, is for me, you know. But, <laughs> but so I, I don't know if I can fully count Hawaii, but I've, I've seen so many different parts of this country and they're so different, so vast, the different kinds of food, the the hospitality, which yep. is across the board. So Yeah, I would say my wife and I are the same way. We feel that we have so much to see in the U.S. still. We've seen so many different parts of the world, all these different corners. And there are places in the U.S. that we see and we're like, wow, I would love to go see that, you know, like I've never been down to Bryce Canyon, yeah. you know, in Utah. I've never been, I've never been to the Grand Canyon. I haven't either. I, I drove by the Grand Canyon. The whole purpose, I went on a, on a cross country trip with my friend from Spain. We drove from Tennessee all the way to Seattle, down the coast of California, and then back to Tennessee. The whole reason for that trip was the Grand Canyon. Oh. That was the whole reason. Because let's go to the Grand Canyon. And then it turned into this like, much bigger thing. But as we were coming across uh, we're about an hour from the Grand Canyon. It was too dark. Hmm. And I wanted to go up and still see it. And my friend was like, no, it's too dark. We're not going to see anything. Let's keep driving. And he was driving and I was Ugh. so mad because, yeah, okay, even if it's dark, you're still going to see it. And and maybe the moonlight is, you know, maybe the stars, maybe it's a different experience. You don't get to see it in the daylight, but it's still. So anyway, yeah. I've not yet been to the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And it's like, yes, I've been to Machu Picchu twice, but I've <laughs> never seen Mount Rushmore. I've never seen the Grand Canyon. I've never, you know. Yeah, but you've seen Yosemite. See, I haven't yet. I've, as a climber, I've never been to Yosemite, which is. I, I've got to go to the Florida Everglades and see the, you know, alligators and yeah. stuff swim around. I've, you know, I've seen shark fins off the coast of North Carolina, things like that. But man, there's okay. a lot to see. There's a lot, a lot to, see. to see in the U S there's a lot of reasons to travel, but I think it was a, a good globe spin for the Yeah, US. that was, that was, we, we talk about the rest of the world, but let's, let's not forget that there's a lot to see in this country. And that's not to say I have a friend of mine who, who, uh, as we're talking about traveling the world and her response was, uh, there's so much in the U S that I haven't seen yet. Why would I go, you know, or why, what's the purpose or reason of traveling or outside the U S and my response, you don't have to see it all in the U S before you see the rest right. of the world. You can kind of do a combination. right? And I think we forget <laughs> how enormous the United States is. Right. When you travel sure. in these countries all over the world, you just, when you come back and you, even when you look at it on the map, you say, wow, it is an enormous country and there's so much to see. It's so diverse. And, you know, we were in Indonesia and we just went back and forth on just the island of Java. And we felt like we saw a whole lot there. But then you think about the breadth of that country. It's like we haven't yeah. even scratched the surface of this thing. Yeah. And that happens almost everywhere. Indonesia is, yeah, as you mentioned, or, or even places like Spain where you say, I saw Madrid and Barcelona. But what right. about Galicia and Asturias? What about right. Sevilla, Granada, Cordoba? You know, so much to see. Yeah. Well, hopefully we've we've given our listeners some some inspiring stories and hopefully they get out there and travel. So it's always, it's important to get out there to see the world, to be safe most of the time. Yep. I would agree. This video podcast is a production of George Fox digital to find more material like this. You can subscribe to George Fox talks on YouTube, Apple podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Our team really appreciates your feedback in the form of likes, comments, and reviews. And we'd really love to hear what you think. To sign up for our weekly email list and to keep up to date with the latest episodes and publications, you can check us out on the web at georgefox.edu talks. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.